Hey, good day, everyone. I'm Rob Espero for the Viral Volley Podcast. I have a very special guest, our northern neighbor, uh, north the border, not south the border. Uh, this is Melissa Umana Paredes. Uh, thanks for joining me here today after, uh, you know, me feeling like I've taken advantage of your current state. You can explain to our fans what's happening to you. But, you know, I just want to just put out there, I was the first one to ask. So, you definitely were the first one to ask. Yeah. And you're making my Monday a lot better and a lot less boring. So I appreciate that. Thank you for having me on. Well, you know, uh, Melissa, being in a, you're a mandatory Canadian 14 day quarantine. I mean, it's got to be good for the head and for your R&R and recovery after the uh, Champions Cup series, right? Definitely. I know. So as soon as I got back to Canada, I had to just hop into a 14 day quarantine. Um, so I literally can't leave the space that I'm in, um, which is very good for catching up on emails I've been neglecting and for uh, resting the body, doing a lot of stretching um, and a lot of snacking. So we'll see how the next week goes. Yeah. I have one week left, so I'm halfway there. Yeah, eager podcasters, vodcasters, and also publications who want to have you on their site. That's also a benefit for us. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I have all the time in the world now. Yeah. Well, uh, let's just go through some of your accomplishments just so people, if they don't know who you are already, just to, to know what you've accomplished in such a short amount of time. Uh, you're the owner of two AVP championships, some pretty good events. Gold Series, Manhattan Beach Open in 2019 in the three set thriller. Uh, Waikiki Open, six FIBB first place finishes, including being a world champion. Crazy. Um, your rookie season uh, was just last year, uh, and he ended up getting best defensive player in the AVP and the newcomer of the year, FIVB best defensive player, FIVB best setter 2018-19, most improved player in the FIVB 2017, team of the year 2019, and top rookie in 2014. So um, quite a resume there, Melissa. <laughs> I know. It's very weird to hear all of that, honestly. Well, I mean, being that, I mean, you're not far beyond your years and age and you have all these accomplishments. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are very uh, excited to see how you've gotten where you're at. So I'm, I'm excited to have this discussion with you, ask you some questions and yeah. just have some fun with you too. Totally. Let's but, do it. Let's start with the most basic question. So um, how did you find yourself getting into volleyball? I had a very natural progression into the sport. Um, I was lucky enough to be born to my parents um, who were Chilean immigrants and my dad played indoor volleyball back in Chile. He was part of the national team there. And then when he immigrated to Canada, um, he started coaching beach volleyball. Um, and so when I was very young, I was around the sport all the time. And um, when I was four years old, he actually coached his team, Mark Keese and John Child, um, to a bronze medal at the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. And I was, yeah, just four. And so I remember watching him on TV and uh, following him on a map everywhere he traveled in the world. And so the idea of an Olympic journey and the idea of being a professional volleyball player and traveling the world was something that was um, ingrained in my head at a very young age and something that I knew that I wanted to pursue. Uh, I mean, being on the beach, being in that environment um, is just so contagious and enthralling and so I was just hooked immediately and that's kind of how it started I, I just haven't really stopped playing the sport and I haven't looked back ever since you know doing my research and you indicated that your dad was a volleyballer but your mom was too it sounds like my mom was not a volleyballer she was a um, professional dancer um, she was in the folkloric Chilean ballet. Um, and so I inherited like none of her grace and choreography skills. I am uh, very uncoordinated, um, much to her dismay. I did not pick up ballet or dancing. Um, she tried when I was very young and it didn't work. So, um, I continued with volleyball. It's a defensive dance that you do behind the block of Sarah. Come on. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Okay. Well, give me some credit there. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, let me ask you, um, who are your most inspirational and influential players or coaches or people growing up while playing the game? Because I know in a previous interview, you, you named quite a few people, but I know that they were mainly players. So I'd want to go extend that beyond. <laughs> let's, let's think about some coaches. I've had some phenomenal coaches over the years that, um, have really impacted my development and my growth as a player. Um, my dad was actually my very first coach. So he mm -hmm. definitely um, helped guide me and um, 
was a mentor for the for the first little bit of my career. Um, although it is really hard to kind of find that balance between dad and coach, so we did navigate that, and I think we found a pretty good balance. Um, and uh, my very first club coach, Merv Mosher, um, was someone who really pushed me and expected a lot from me. And when I didn't deliver, he let me know. And I think that was someone who was so important in my life, especially at that time. I think I was like 15, 16 years old. Those were like formative years in my development. I was playing indoor volleyball at the time. And I think he saw potential in me before I did. And um, I was quite lazy back then, honestly. And when he pushed me, sometimes I didn't love it. And, but I just needed someone like him in my life to be able to push me. And then I found the older I got, the more I was seeking for his approval um, because I, I recognized that he saw more in me than I did. And um, I did really appreciate that. Um, and I still, to this day, um, love him and still keep in touch with him quite a bit. And um, I'd have to say Leonard Crap, who was the um, beach volleyball head coach for Team Canada for many years, especially mm -hmm. in my development. Um, he kind of took over the program and he, I think, was really huge and formative in my development as well. Um, and just teaching me kind of the basic skills and the fundamentals of the game and just hammering down my technique, something that I never really spend a lot of time on. Um, I, and, and then, of course, lastly, um, Scott Davenport, who, uh, I mean, is, he's my current coach and I've been with him for four years now. And he has just brought me to a whole another level. Like all those previous coaches really helped me in my developmental years. Um, and then Scott has really helped me in my professional years and just kind of get me to the player that I've always wanted to be. Um, so I think those, those four men in my life have been very, very uh, impactful. Well, how about from a player standpoint, just for the people that didn't catch the FIVB Beach World ball interview that I was going to kind of tap on some information on that I discovered about you. <laughs> oh, gosh, I'm nervous. Okay. Okay, let me see. Let me see if I can try and remember. Um, I think I remember saying that Marta Menegatti from Italy was one of the, the first players that I saw that I kind of like recognized myself in or could see myself being there and I think because she was close in age to me and she was on the FIVB world tour at the mm -hmm. senior level playing with all the big dogs and and she was in the mix and I wanted to see myself there and so through her I kind of like was living vicariously through her and and mm -hmm. I remember thinking like I want to get there one day and so she was someone I definitely like I think like pushed me to realize that I can do it um and then of course you know you have the greats you have Carrie and Misty, um, who I always grew up watching. Um, and when I started playing on the world tour, Agatha um, from Brazil was someone who really, she was kind of like a, a mother figure on tour. Um, I really looked up to her, the way she played, the way she carried herself on the court. She was someone I wanted to emulate. And um, she was always very caring. You know, we were competitors, but she was still very caring both on and off the court. And um, I really, I really loved her a lot. Wow. Um, you know, one of the people you mentioned was actually Laura Ludwig, and oh, uh, you compared yourself to her, and I was like, gosh, that, that makes total sense personality-wise, because when I first met both of you, I think the first one was the uh, World Series of Beach Volleyball. I may get the year wrong, 2017 in Long sounds Beach? Sounds about right. Yep, sounds um, about right. I'd met both of you, and it's like, she's like the German you, and <laughs> you're the Canadian her, because no. both such a... a, a excellent countenance just radiate joy and a love of the game and a passion and it's, it's very easy to see that in in both your personalities so it didn't surprise oh. me when you said that she was one of the people that that you saw as someone who's influencing you in the game you know and I was gonna just mention her but I felt like I was going off on a tangent but yes <laughs> Laura Ludwig is just someone I love and just seeing her light on the court and how fierce she is how much she loves the game and you know you can tell how much she loves life too. Like she's mm -hmm. such a, she's such a funny woman and she's, she's just so great to be around. You can't help but smile. And, and that brings a lot of positivity to me. So I kind of wanted to exude that as well. And um, I, that is like a massive compliment from you. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. You gotta, you gotta give props to the people who just bring so much attention to the sport because I, I love seeing great ambassadors of the game because mm -hmm. that's what grows the game is, is the personalities really being themselves and seeing that, Oh my gosh, you're incredible people not only on the court, but off the court. So kudos to you and Laura and all the other great athletes out there who are, who are just great ambassadors to the game. Thank you so much. Um, you know, uh, your transition from indoor to beach, um, it seemed like the university you played for, York, 
was a or is a volleyball powerhouse in Canada. I, I try to track the game because I noticed that that's the alma mater of Brandy Wilkerson too. Yeah. Like, oh, wait, so both of you went to the same university? I mean, that's yeah. got to be kind of like the USC, UCLA, Nebraska, Texas <laughs> here in the United States because there's some solid talent on that roster. We definitely would like to think so. I mean, <laughs> when, when Brandy and I played on that team, we were definitely one of the best teams in our province, in our league, and probably definitely up there um, in the nation as well. And um, we, were, we came in the, the same year together. We were both rookies on that same team. And um, it was a blast being a part of that team. And we were a very high performance team. Um, we never really got the results that we wanted, but we had so much talent and we had just a ton of fun. I, I, I still have a soft spot for that program in my heart. Um, I haven't been to a game, gosh, and I don't know how long I'm usually always traveling, but um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful program. It's a program that I actually grew up um, watching because my dad was their coach for many, many years as well. Um, okay. So that's actually why I went to that school. Um, and so I would, you know, when I was a young kid, I would be on the buses watching all of their games and traveling with them. And then one day I was on that bus as an athlete myself. So it, it did come full circle. Um, and I, and I do love that school. And one of the reasons why I also, uh, went to that school was because it's really close to our full-time training facility for team Canada for the beach volleyball program. So, mm -hmm. um, they're only minutes away. And so I was able to kind of do both. I was able to um, still keep up with beach volleyball and be a part of the national team for beach volleyball and still play university ball while studying. So I had a busy few years there for sure, but, um, it was able, like I was able to kind of keep up with everything that I wanted to do. Well, it sounds like, uh, the Canadian national team or volleyball Canada would poach York university for all their talent, huh? <laughs> yeah, it appears that way. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's, uh, that's actually a good segue to my next question. You know, just in recent years, you've really begin to see, a rise of Canadian talent, um, not only on the indoor scene, but the beach scene, because you know, your partner, Sarah, Brandy Wilkerson, Heather Bansley, Taylor Pischke, and then current collegiate beach standouts like the McNamara twins, love those gals, hi Megan, mm -hmm. hi Nicole, um, <laughs> Alex Paletto. Um, can you share with us the growth and development and transformation of Volleyball Canada's beach volleyball program? Oh gosh, how much time do we have? I mean, <laughs> it's honestly been such 14 a days. Joy. That's your quarantine, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I only have one week left. I, um, but it's it's been a real pleasure to kind of see the growth of Team Canada internationally. Because um, when I was growing up for the longest time, no one really saw Canada as a threat or really took Canada seriously. I mean, we're a winter sport country and um, we're now one of the top countries in beach volleyball. So there's definitely some paradox there and there's some irony. Um, and it has taken a lot of um, struggle for us to get to where we are. And I think that is probably why we got to where we are because, um, you know, we aren't one of those programs that had a lot of support to begin with or that had a lot of attention and you know we also don't really have like a super deep roster the way that maybe some other countries do we're not a super huge populated country um, and a lot of our athletes go down south and play indoor and so for us to keep talent in Canada was really hard and um, it slowly started to happen where um, you know, at youth divisions, you'd start seeing some teams getting medals. I remember the first time I got a medal at the under 19 world championships. Um, it was a big deal. It was a big deal in Canada. And you could see people starting to believe, um, to believe that Canada could, could be up there and that what we were doing back home, you know, it was working. Um, you know, there were some flaws for sure. I mean, who doesn't have some program flaws, but you know, it, we, were, we were trending in the right direction. And then slowly and slowly at the youth level, we started to see a lot more, um, uh, development and success mm -hmm. and then it would start to translate you know at the same time you would see on the senior world tour when Sarah came over her and Heather started to get a lot of medals on the senior world tour and so then things were starting to come together and you would see um, you know yeah we were just we were trending in an upward direction and um, it was just really inspiring to see so many different people that we grew up watching and playing against you know becoming successful. And so when we established a full-time training center here in Toronto, um, 
that's when it felt a little bit more professional. That's when we started to kind of get some backing, see some resources and see some results. Um, and now, you know, we have this program where we call it camp based. If you're on the senior A team, you have the ability to be able to travel and train anywhere. And so Sarah and I choose to train in California. And so okay. to be able to have that freedom, to be able to choose where you want to train, to be able to choose your coach um, and not have to be in Canada, in Toronto, but you can mm -hmm. pick your best training environment. I think that's also led to at least our success. I can't really speak to every other team, but that's definitely helped us in the long run. Well, I mean, Hermosa Beach is a terrible place. It is awful. <laughs> no, it is definitely the best place that we, it's the best office, honestly, that I could have picked. And yeah. um, it has the best training partners as well. Um, it's, it's honestly one of the, the best places and probably one of the reasons why we were able to accelerate so quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this, and I, I won't ask you to name who the other team could be qualifying for the Olympics. Obviously, you and Sarah have qualified by winning world championships, but um, where do you see Team Canada, particularly on the women's side, in the Olympics? Oh, gosh. I mean, I think that Team Canada will be a huge threat. I think we have you know, both teams have medal potential, and I think if I speak to Sarah and myself, I think we're going in looking to win the gold. So um, that's what we've kind of set ourselves up for from day one of our partnership. That was our goal was to be in Tokyo together. And, you know, the more that we started to play, our goal changed to not just be in Tokyo, but to win Tokyo. So that's what, that's what we're looking to do. Well, you, you obviously have national pride for Canada, but for Volleyball Canada, how important is it for you and Sarah to bring the gold medal back to Canada from the Olympics? I think it would, I think it would be really uh, special. I think it would be pretty historic and I think it would allow for the game in Canada to really grow. I, I think even just seeing the response and the impact after the world championships, um, after we won that last year and just to see how many young girls started to pick up beach volleyball and how much the game grew and how much, you know, Canadians noticed that, we are a threat internationally in the sport of beach volleyball, I think was so important for the sport. And I think, you know, beach volleyball is a little bit behind in where it should be, I think, because it's a sport that deserves so much attention and has so much more potential to grow and it just needs to be noticed. And so I just hope the sport gets to grow. And if we can do that on the international Olympic stage, it would be so important. Excellent. Well, so let's jump into, um, just a few years ago, before playing in, in AVP events in uh, 2019, it seems the only competitive playing experience available for you and Sarah as Canadian national team members is playing internationally in FIVB events or Norsega events. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts now that you have the opportunity to complete, well, closer to home, so to speak, in AVP events? it's such an honor to be able to play um, in the AVP events and be a part of the AVP family. It's something that I actually grew up watching as well. Every Sunday it would be on TV. Um, and I remember one day thinking, you know, I want to be able to play on that. And so um, it, I think it's just it's so important for us to have that opportunity to just continue to compete at a very high level. You know, it's not like the AVP is um, an easy tournament whatsoever you have really strong international teams that are there so um you still get quite good competition and it's still a way to um you know make a living and that's what we're here to do and i want to be able to show people and young girls and young athletes that beach volleyball is a viable professional sport um and so yeah i think it's just it's really nice also for um, my family and friends to be able to watch these a lot easier and even be able to travel to them and be there in person because a lot of the times they can't travel internationally or they mm -hmm. just can't take that time. But, you know, they could make a weekend trip to Seattle or to Chicago or to LA or New York. And so um, I think that means more to me than, than the rest for sure. Now, how many uh, months or weeks a year do you spend training in Hermosa Beach and do you sleep on a couch locally <laughs> or do you have a satellite location with a room? What's yeah. it look like for a, a professional volleyball athlete, an international professional volleyball athlete? Yeah. Um, so typically I usually uh, would come out to LA in about January, mid January, mm -hmm. and I would probably be there until October. 
Um, so I'm there the majority of the year. Um, obviously, in between those months, we're traveling internationally, playing on the FIVB tour. Um, and so sometimes we're on the road for six to seven weeks. But um, I don't really get to like pack up and go home until October, November. And then I'm home for the holidays. And then I pack up again and come back out to train. So um, I spend almost all my time in Hermosa Beach. And for the first few years, I was kind of jumping around from place to place. But um, as of last year, I found my like solid home and it's actually um, a part Canadian family who has a place in um, Manhattan Beach and um, I stay with them in their guest room. And it's they're- it's an they, embassy like, in Manhattan Beach? The Canadian that's right, embassy? yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but they have a little guest room that they basically adopted me and um, they're like my little billet family and I love them so much, they're so kind. So I'm very lucky to have that, uh, that space to stay in when I'm there training. And you have some fans for sure, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, they definitely cheer for us. Well, let me ask you this now that, that you, you're here 10 months a year and, and playing in the AVP events. Um, what are your thoughts on yours and Sarah's success during the 2019 season? And did you think that you'd be as successful as you were? On the AVP? Yeah. I mean, we knew it was going to be a challenge and we knew that it was going to be a great opportunity to compete at a high level. And I think we had our goals and expectations, you know, were to try and meet every semifinal, every final that we could. Um, and aside from a couple, I think we did that, but, um, you know, any game a team can come out, like there's so many talented teams. So it's, we weren't going in super like overconfident because we know the talent that there is here, you know, we train against this talent. And so, um, we took that, you know, pretty mindfully, but um, I think being able to win the Manhattan Open and then to, to finish the season winning in Hawaii um, exceeded our expectations for sure. Um, you know, that's the granddaddy of them all. It's like the Wimbledon of beach volleyball to win Manhattan Beach. So that was something that was super special for us, um, something that we really wanted. And um, to say that we went into that season thinking we were going to do that, I think would be a lie on my part. I didn't think that that was going to, we were going to finish that season and, and have our names cemented on the pier forever. So um, that was really special. Yeah, it's pretty cool. A pretty cool accomplishment because that pier, I mean, anyone in the world of volleyball knows if your plaque, if your name is on the plaque in the pier, you had a serious, you had some serious game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a special feeling for sure. Now, do you feel to say your success um, also uh, transfers over to your success on the FIVB level as well? Because it seems like since 2014, 2013, you've been pretty successful anyways. Um, internationally, um, you know, we've definitely had our ups and downs, but mm -hmm. we were, 2019 was a really special year. And um, since partnering with Sarah, it's been a very successful um, few years on the FIV world tour. And um, that definitely contributes, I think, being able to play internationally, get a taste of different ball out there, and then also be able to kind of, um, you know, come to the AVP and, and play a different style of ball here too, I think is important for us to get a taste of both. And um, they both kind of help each other and they both let us um, experiment and grow and be challenged. And um, yeah, I think we're really lucky to be able to have the opportunity to play on, to play on both tours. Well, that's a great place to break there. I'm with uh, Melissa Humana Paredes. Uh, Team Canada or Volleyball Canada. The, I've been going both ways with all the indoor people as well. So uh, we'll be right back in just a moment on the Viral Volley Podcast. Hey, welcome back, fans. Once again, you're watching the Viral Volley podcast and vodcast, and with me is a very special guest, and uh, enjoy conversations with her. It's Melissa Humana Paredes, and uh, uh, thanks again for taking the time uh, today to be on the podcast and vodcast. I'm having a great time. Thanks so much, Rob. Excellent. Hey, you know, just recently, what concluded was probably the only professional volleyball event we're going to see in the next few months. Um, the 2020 AVP Champions Cup Series presented by Acer. Got to get those sponsors in there because we are so thankful that they put their money behind this and to host such a great event. Oh my um, gosh, yeah, so grateful to them. Oh, no doubt. I mean, a lot of people were so happy just to see volleyball being played, but at a great level, which leads me to my first question. 
obviously getting the notification that this event was a green light. How long did you have to train before the Champions Cup Series? We found out about this on a Wednesday, I believe. And then that Saturday, I flew out to LA. Um, mm -hmm. And we had three weeks to prepare for the first stop of the AVP Champions Cup. So we didn't have long. Three weeks is the shortest that I've ever had in terms of a lead up to competition. And that was after about almost a four month stint off of volleyball, which is also the longest I've ever had off of volleyball and not just volleyball, but like proper training. Mm -hmm. So to say that I was out of volleyball shape was an understatement. Um, and mm -hmm. we had three weeks to kind of prepare. So um, it was definitely challenging. It was humbling. Um, it was exciting, but um, overall, an incredible experience and um, I wouldn't really change anything honestly right. even though we didn't really get the results that we wanted mm -hmm. I still think we went about it and we're still able to reach some of our goals you're going for world domination but you just had an <laughs> AVP champion series to dominate so <laughs> right exactly <laughs> well you know when you say you had three weeks to train was that actual court time with Sarah or was that just some weight training quarantine for like a week and then have two weeks of court time what did that look like so it was three weeks as soon as I landed um, we did about two weeks um, individual training mm -hmm. um, so I didn't see Sarah for two weeks uh, and we were just I was working one-on-one -on -one with my coach just to kind of like get my sand legs back to kind of get the mm -hmm. skills back and to get the feel for the ball again mm -hmm. um, and so then in our final week of prep that's when the team kind of reunited and um, we kind of, I, we were with Sarah again and um, it was really tough to kind of manage um, getting my skills back kind of sharp mm -hmm. and then getting this team skills kind of on point and fluid, but also trying to get like strength back and like get back in the gym, which was hard. Um, there was a lot going on. So, and it was like a, a real big shock to the body because I was literally coming from a living room gym with, <laughs> you know, a few weights here and there um, to like fully into it. And I remember my number one concern was to not get injured. Just don't rush into this and take mm -hmm. your time into a lead up. You know, as much as we do want to like get back into competition super, super quickly, we also don't want to get injured. So um, I think that was a priority for the team first and wow. foremost. And I think we did that. And that's why kind of our lead up was a lot slower and we took our time getting ready. Um, and I think it showed. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely in the first few weeks. <laughs> wow. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll have a uh, concluding comment at the end, but I'm actually kind of shocked to hear that you felt that way about your performance, but we'll, we'll talk a little later. We're going to talk specifics here from week to week. Okay. Um, <laughs> Monster Hydro Cup was the first of the series. Uh, you and Sarah got a third semifinal loss to April and Alex. Great yes. setter. And statistically, yes. you and Sarah edged April and Alex out. I mean... That's interesting. Everywhere. I didn't even know that. Yeah. That kind of <laughs> makes that loss worse. <laughs> well, I mean, because you battled hard, but came up short. But I mean, out of the gate, it looked like you were playing very well with Sarah. Can you comment on your first week performance? Yeah, I mean, def the first day of the first week was really rusty. Um, and I mean, both of us heading into that first day, we were both so nervous. I think, yeah, I, I'm not going to speak for Sarah, but I, I didn't feel like we were there yet to be able to compete. Um, and, you know, we were kind of taking the whole experience with a grain of salt because we just kind of wanted to get back together. We wanted to get back training um, and we wanted to just like touch the ball again. So our expectations were a little bit lower and our standards were a little, a little bit lower. Um, but you know, I was trying to be like very kind and gentle and give myself a grace period because I didn't really feel like myself. And mm -hmm. um, I was kind of nervous to like compete again because I didn't mm -hmm. know what kind of level I would be able to get to. That mm -hmm. first day was really rough. You know, we um, almost lost our first game to Carissa Cook and Jace Pardon. Uh -huh. We were down 12-9 in the third set. And, you know, even if you're not playing your best, when that adrenaline kicks in, like we kick it into the next next year and so we were able to come back and win that and I think that was really important for us to do and that kind of like fueled us for the next few games and so when we played Alex in April in the semis um, we had played three games at that point so the rest was kind of just chipping off and yeah. um, 
you know, when you play another team of that level and that caliber and someone, you know, we have a long history with, um, the adrenaline is going to take over and, and your competitive mm -hmm. side is going to come out. And so it definitely did. I think I, again, I don't think that we actually played that well. Um, maybe according to the stats, it's a different story, but, um, <laughs> you know, I think we did come out strong in that first set and then, you know, you can always count on Alex and April to make it an interesting game. So, and they did, and they came out strong in the second set. And then, um, yeah, I mean, the third set, I feel like they got an early lead. I honestly can't remember. It's all quite a big blur, but um, <laughs> I just, you know, it wasn't our best performance, but I think it, we came off that weekend and, and had tons that we wrote down of things we wanted to work on for the I next weekend. 15, 12 in the third, if I, if my memory serves me well. It was. So it was, it was definitely a battle back in. So it was. And, and you know what? The freeze helped us. You know, that's the one time I'll enjoy the freeze because um, <laughs> we, were, we were down quite a bit, but we were able to like kind of crawl back and make it a little bit more interesting. And, you know, you just kind of like fuel the fire a little bit. So that was a lot of fun. Well, there was so much excitement anyways, just with it being the first event. And there were so many viewers online and on NBC that, we're just amazed at the level of play coming out of a, a shelter and quarantine end time. So <laughs> let's yeah. shift over to week two, which is the Wilson Cup. This time you bust through the semifinals, but you had an incredible uh, battle against Sarah Hughes and fellow country person Brandy Wilkerson <laughs> in the semis. You had an extended first set, I believe is 27, 25 or 26, 24. And then- Was it really? Uh, yeah, and a, another deuce set victory. Um, going into the final and um, you ended up losing 0-2 to April and Alex again but yep. <laughs> obviously yeah, memory is, is, is gone but how did you feel your performance was during that second week being that you actually broke into the, the final match? Yeah I think it was definitely getting better and, I, and our goal was over the three weeks was it was to improve every week and to like take those lessons work on them in the week leading up and then you know hopefully it came to fruition that weekend and i think we were able to do that i think um we took a lot of notes from the first week and then mm -hmm. practiced and then we're ready for that following week and then in the finals it just didn't you know april and alex came out so strong that game yeah. went by like this um i don't remember it at all <laughs> and it just went by so quickly and i think you know, every time we were stepping on the court, we we're just getting better and we were getting better and, you know, we we're starting to flow. And so I think after that finals, it was pretty dejecting because I don't think we were even like kind of close to a level that we were playing leading up to that. Um, and I think after that, we were like guns, like we wanted to come out guns blazing the next week because we felt like we were finally like starting to click a little bit yeah. um, and heading into our third week. I mean, maybe I'm stealing your thunder, but we're going to head into the third week. Okay. For sure. <laughs> we're going there. Heading into the third week, it felt a lot stronger um, on both of our parts. Um, things were starting to like fit defensively and our offensive system was getting better. And we were just, you know, we were getting a little bit more creative. We were trying different things. Um, I still didn't feel like myself out there necessarily the whole time but we would see like glimpses of like sarah and mel um from before covid and that was always really nice and really promising to see so um yeah heading into that third week we were like ready we were ready to ball and i think we did um i mean you can go into the stats of, of the <laughs> porsche cup but it's the one question i'm not looking forward to asking but i'm gonna, I'm gonna summarize your first two weeks just because one of the things that I, I drew from watching your play and looking at your numbers and all that was and you actually alluded to it in before we actually went live was um, you said that that you need to gain your muscle back. But one of the things I noticed about your play particularly is, um, and I talked to Jeff Alzina, the court two commentator said that, man, Melissa just looks lean and she's faster on her feet in her lateral movements or she's reading well or both because you had 77 digs in week one, yeah, 77 in week two, 144. And the next closest person was like 30 digs behind you. So I'm like, wow, she's come out guns a-blazing, at least defensively. And you know what? I actually, that was like the one aspect of my game where I actually felt good in. And, and yeah, I felt speed, speedy back there. And I felt really quick defensively. Um, and I, I did, I was receiving quite a few comments about um, 
looking leaner. And I honestly don't know if I would take that as a compliment because, um, oh, sorry, no, 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 not from you. No, it's, it's, I mean, I it's nice. It's, good way. it's no, totally. It's nice to hear for sure. But, um, you know, it was just, I knew this was a fact that I had lost a lot of muscle, um, mm -hmm. since I wasn't able to train properly throughout quarantine. And I was kind of, you know, stuck in my living room trying to train out of that. So I wasn't as explosive offensively. I wasn't as, I wasn't jumping as high. I wasn't able to hit the ball with as much pace as I'm used to. And I think that was very obvious over the three weeks. Um, but yeah, I think I was a lot lighter in the backcourt and maybe that contributed. So um, I, I was really happy with how my defensive game was. Um, that was something that I really kind of like rooted my um, goals going into each week on was just to like be one of the best defensive players out there each week. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy that I was able to kind of accomplish that um, because there are some really phenomenal defenders out there on the AVP. Like oh, it's yeah. not an easy, it's not an easy field. And to come out, you know, week after week and, and be one of the top defenders was something that I, that I really wanted to work for and something that I was really humbled by. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, there's like this trend of go for broke, lay it all on the line type defenders behind the block between you, Sarah Hughes, Sarah Sponsel, mm -hmm. and Kenzie Punnett really came to light this last that yeah. final series. So, I mean, it's exciting to see what's happening behind the block. So, totally. Yeah. Um, so, let's go into third week. <laughs> You know what? The third week is, is very bittersweet because the first day was so good. Like the first day we had, we played Tracy Callahan, Chrissy Jones. We played Emily Stockman and Kelly Kalinske. And those are two really strong teams. And yeah. um, I thought we played a really clean volleyball and like we came out really efficiently. We were playing really well. Um, those games were you know, I'd say we, we handled it pretty well and um, we felt really good going into the second day, going into mm -hmm. Sunday and we had the semifinals against um, Sponsor Clays and yep. nothing worked. It was one of those perfect games that everything goes right for them, nothing goes <laughs> right for you and it just felt like we could not catch a break. We could not get any momentum. Nothing would like click that game and and they were just playing out of their minds and when that happens like I remember at one point in the game I just looked at Sarah I threw my hands up and I was like I don't know I think <laughs> I actually do. saw that because I'm like it's the first time I've seen them <laughs> look kind of like deflated <laughs> yeah yeah it, it was really deflating too because we were feeling really good um and yeah I mean what a sh am I allowed to swear I won't what a crappy way to go out um if crappy's a swear word that's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're Canadian over here. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, that was really, really, really bittersweet. I mean, we knew yeah. that we still finished second overall in the series. And again, that was one of our goals was to finish in the top three and to continuously get better each week. And, you know, to be one of, one of like the second team was a great accomplishment but to end on that note sucked like yeah. there's nothing there was nothing good about that um and yeah i don't know like it, i rewatched the game like two times and mm -hmm. there were so many times where i was like oh yeah we're gonna get a point and then they would somehow save a ball put it into like the deep corner and mm -hmm. then there was just nothing you could do about it and so they yeah. played a great game we did not and yeah well, we and have we, common sense says not to drop the numbers I've got here, but we'll just say on, on oh God. Sarah, Sarah and Kelly's end, I mean, they got really creative and their shots are falling. And uh, defensively, um, Sarah was just on fire. I mean, she oh, yeah. Doing new gear. So, you know, and all, you know, even with the April and Alex loss the previous week, I mean, they were playing intergalactic. I mean, everyone was commenting, oh, my gosh, they've kicked it up like 10 levels on everyone. So, yeah. But yeah. Uh, Totally. No, you could see the work that they've put in. Sorry, what were you going to say? Oh, no, I just go for it. Go ahead and finish. Yeah, I mean, it was actually really interesting for me to see, like, the work that I think a lot of teams were putting on um, in quarantine. Like, you could see people were still at it and, and putting in some work, and, and that was um, really encouraging, and it made kind of us want to really raise our level because Sarah and I hadn't really been together for four months. I hadn't been on a beach in four months, so – um, it was, it was hard for me to kind of like get back up to that level and like compete with these teams. And so for us to be able to rise to the occasion and still compete, even though it wasn't our best performances, um, was still very encouraging for both Sarah and I. Yeah. 
Well, you know, it is bittersweet, but this is more the sweet part. Because of yours and Sarah's finish of the Champion Cup Series, you got a third, second, third. <clears throat> you finished with the bonus money on top of the prize money for each of the event, which is $25,000. I mean, can't feel that bad, can you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually, actually, I think the $25,000 was for the first place. We, I think we got a bonus of $15,000, but still okay. very, very good. Very happy that we were still given this opportunity to make some money in a season that we thought was going to be over. Um, mm -hmm. So overall, yeah, a really incredible experience. So grateful and thankful that we had that opportunity. Yeah. Well, individually, I mean, you were in the top six for kills with 157. Which is shocking <laughs> if I'm not going to lie. <laughs> That's why you said that you're, you just weren't hitting with enough pace and shots. And then uh, <laughs> you led the entire series with 184 digs, uh, which led me and a lot of people believe you're pretty dialed in. Um, what are your thoughts on your individual play? I mean, you said that you weren't, you didn't feel like you were that confident in your play. I'm like, wait a second, you're still top five in the categories. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I appreciate that. That is really sweet. I think um, it is also honestly very encouraging to hear that even not feeling my best and not having the proper lead up that I wanted, um, maybe not being physically where I want to be, I could still, you know, put up some good numbers and still perform well enough to like finish second and, and compete at a high level. Um, I still think that my performance was not what I wanted it to be. Um, again, like I'm really, really happy with my defensive play. Like that's mm -hmm. something that I really um, wanted to nail down. And I think I did. Um, but there was still a lot that I feel like there's a lot of room for improvement, which is exciting mm -hmm. in case we have another opportunity this fall or winter. Um, you know, I know what I'm going to work on, how I'm going to work on it so that I can come out even stronger the next time. Excellent. Um, now, looking back at the uh, Champions Cup series, um, what are your thoughts on being able to partake in the first professional event to occur in our COVID culture? I feel so lucky to have been given that opportunity. Um, I remember when I first heard about it, it was like a no brainer for me. It was mm -hmm. at a time where I was like, I need to compete. Like I'm itching to compete right now. I don't recognize who I am. I need some like normalcy in my life again. I need a routine. And so when AVP announced this, I, it was like a sign. It was like, I need to, I need to be a part of this. And so I flew, I booked a flight literally within minutes <laughs> of hearing about that. And I was like, there, I'm coming. Um, and she was like, oh my God, okay. So um, I flew down and I just could not be more grateful for that opportunity. You know, as soon as I landed though, I was a little nervous because as soon as I landed, um, the cases started to spike in LA. And so I was like, oh my gosh, should I just make a huge mistake? Should yes, I go back to Canada? Made it spike. No. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, exactly. They knew that I was coming. So they wanted to spike it. Um, but yeah, I, you know, as COVID aside, I was so grateful for this opportunity for the mm -hmm. AVP, for everybody involved, all the sponsors involved to be able to like put this on in the middle of the pandemic and to do it mm -hmm. so well, to do it so professionally, to mm -hmm. do it so cautiously as well. And with, you know, athletes in mind with, you know, citizens in mind and still put on like an incredible show um, mm -hmm. on NBC and on Amazon Prime and to get everybody excited again about volleyball, I think it helped grow the sport yeah. tons. And, you know, I could, I could keep going about how grateful yeah. I am. But, yeah, incredible. I definitely want to shout out to some of the names that you may or may not know that helped put this on because I know they've had to basically part the Red Sea. They've had to create a miracle. Uh, Donald Sun, yeah. Al Lau, Josh Glazebrook, Jeff Conover and the rest of the AVP crew. Excellent work. And yes. uh, there are a lot of grateful people for their efforts. Yeah, I agree. I'll, I am indebted to them. You know, they always do a phenomenal job at every AVP tournament, but especially this, to be able to put this on and in the interest of the athletes and in the interest of, you know, the fans watching at home to give us something to all rally around is mm -hmm. something that I think we all needed in this pandemic. I think it's something that we were missing. So kudos to them. Excellent. Well, let's take a break right there. I, uh, that was all just the AVP Champions Cup stuff. So uh, this is Melissa Umana Paredes, uh, Volleyball Canada, Team Canada, uh, here on the Viral Volley Podcast. Welcome back, everyone. I'm with Melissa Humana Paredes in, I think you're in British Columbia at this point, right? For the Viral Volley podcast. 
and I am happily taking advantage of her quarantine status. She's got one week left to go, so we may get her on for another episode since she's got a lot of time on her hands. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to be back. Hey, well, I wanted to touch on the 2021, well, the now 2021 Tokyo Olympics uh, with you and Sarah. You know, you've obviously already qualified for the Olympics with your world championship um, uh, win. And now, but you've had some previous Olympic experience. You, uh, in another interview, refer, referred to you yourself as a sparring team for the Rio 2016 Olympics. Can you uh, share a little bit about that experience in, in Rio? Yes, I would love to. I love talking about this experience because it was so much fun. It was so formative in my development. I think it was so important that I had that opportunity and I'm so grateful. Um, so I went to the 2016 Rio Olympics as an alternate. Um, and essentially I was there, you know, in case someone got injured, I would, you know, kind of fill in. And once the game started, I was a part of the team that would help train our Canadian teams and prepare for their opponents at the Olympics. And it was an incredible experience. And it was um, honestly an all day thing because not only did we help our women's teams, but we also helped our men's team. So we would have four practices in one day. Sometimes we'd start at like 9 a.m. We would finish at like 11 p.m. And so it, we were running around all day and we were just so happy to be there. We would basically do anything to help these teams. Um, that, you know, that sometimes that also included cooking for them and kind of like creating some of their snacks. We were in the kitchen. We would go grocery shopping to get their food ready. And um, we would also train with them. And we also got to see like the behind the scenes of the Olympics, like what goes on um, that athletes have to deal with and, and, you know, what are the distractions that they have to deal with? And we got to experience it all without the pressures of really competing. So I think as a developing athlete, it was such a formative experience, super, super, well, informative in that um, you got to see what the Olympic games were all about without competing. And so heading into Tokyo, I think I'm better prepared because I had that experience already in my back pocket. Wow. Now, let me ask you this, who were the other we that was with you? Because I, I, I don't think you alluded to that in your FIVB beach interview, but I know obviously you were there, but who were the other people that, who was your team when you were training or sparring? So my partner at the time was, was Taylor Pischke and okay. she wasn't able to attend. Um, she wasn't able to go with me to Rio and, and be um, that sparring team. So um, Brandy Wilkerson actually came instead of, of Taylor. And, and so together we were that um, sparring team. We were that alternate team. Um, and so we got to experience all of that together, which was such a blast because um, you know, we knew each other very well. We played on the same team together. So then to be able to experience this whole incredible event on top of that um was a ton of fun yeah um so i, I may this may be a put on the spot kind of question so i'm going to word it this way outside of the canadian teams who do you see making a push to the medal stand in tokyo <laughs> oh well i think that i mean you can probably count on um alex and april making a push you can count on the brazilians making a push both teams you can count on the Australians making a push. You can count, oh gosh, you can count on the Germans making a push. You can count on the Czech girls. Like literally there are so many good teams, which is like terrifying, but also so great about this sport, especially on the women's mm -hmm. side. There are so many good teams out there um, that can all and all probably will make a push for, for the medal round at the Olympics. Um, mm -hmm. So it's going to be exciting. Well, Let's go into the lighter content here because I went and found that, that I've been alluding to it a little bit here, the FIVB Beach World interview. So I picked some information, I've cherry picked some information. Uh -oh. here. So in the Facebook Live, you indicated that you thought that you and Sarah could easily take Anders Moll and Christian Sorum. Do you still yes. feel that way? <laughs> I do, I do. And let me tell you why. If we play on a women's net, which I don't know if, if that's part of the rules or not. Um, I think we could serve them off the court. I would like to see men try and pass women's float serves. I think that they would struggle a little bit. And then, you know what, if they did end up passing it and setting it up, we would be in trouble. But I think we would really have to rely on our serves in order to beat them. All right, fair enough. Um, <laughs> and also, did you know that the last blog entry you had was January 6th of 2014 for your fans? Blog? Do I have a blog? Yeah, it's on WordPress. <laughs> Oh my God, no. Let me, let me read the letter. that? 
follow the exciting life of a member of the Canadian National Beach Volleyball Team. And oh the first God. picture, or actually the latest entry, is a puppy. <gasps> that sounds about right. That sounds like me. It says um, Happy New Year and latest updates. Oh my God. You know what? You are totally right. And thank you for bringing this up. I'm not embarrassed at all. Um, this was a blog I started, I think when I got injured, I, I broke my ankle and I was like recounting my recovery experience and I wanted people to follow along my journey. And then I think I stopped after the new year. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Oh, I should go revisit that blog. Well, it, well, you know, instead of writing now, I actually vlog. So I have a YouTube channel where oh, go for it. <laughs> yeah, follow me, like, and subscribe on YouTube, everybody. Um, <laughs> Melissa Humana Paredes, and um, I've been doing it for a few years now, and it's just—it's a ton of fun. It's a lot of work actually to edit videos behind the scenes. I'm not gonna lie. Wow. Oh, I get it. Kudos <laughs> to everybody who does that. Oh my gosh, so hard. But it's a lot of fun. And I just kind of show behind the scenes on the world tour at AVPs in my life. And it's, you know, it's fun. It's fun. Go check it out. <laughs> well, I mean, that's where I discovered that you have a love of animals. What is your favorite kind of animal? Dogs. dogs. You know, dogs for sure. I have a few breeds that are my favorite. Um, I do love an English bulldog, which is not mm -hmm. the norm. Um, not everyone thinks that they're super cute like I do. I think they're adorable. The more rolls, the better. I also love Bernie's Mountain Dogs, those big dogs. Do you know yep. that they're so gorgeous? They're St. Bernard's, semi-St. Bernard's. They are the cousins to St. Bernard's, exactly. <clears throat> and I have a soft spot for Golden Retrievers because I, I had one. She passed away last year, but I love Golden Retrievers. So you can't use a pet or do you not have a pet with you to use for training? Because I've seen in training videos, they're using their pets to lift and do squats. And I know. Food. How much fun is that? No, I don't have any of that. No, I'm staying here with, with my boyfriend and um, he is way too massive for me to lift. So I have nothing to help me. It might benefit you to get your muscle back if he's that big. Exactly. You know what? That's true. Maybe we'll just have to force it. Yeah. All right. It says you indicate you like to go to concerts and you'd even go by yourself. Um, All the time. What's the, if the world were to end tomorrow, I hope it doesn't, what concert would you want to see? Oh my God. This is like or asking what your favorite child is. Um, the first one that came into my mind actually was Kings of Leon. I've seen Kings of Leon twice already. So I know they're amazing. I love, mm -hmm. I love them. Um, I would actually love to see Hosier. Oh, I haven't seen yeah. him yet. Um, would love to see him as well. Uh, yeah, those are the first that came to mind. All right, fair enough. Good choices. Thank you. Now, how about this? What song gets you all pumped or psyched out before you play a match? Oh, gosh. You know, we have a few, as a team, we have a few team songs that um, really get us fired up. Um, there's this one by Coldplay that I remember they played in Porridge in between our at our gold medal match and it's like a sky full of stars but it's the remix oh. of that one that oh. one oh it gets gotcha, me dog. fired up you Rock know that solid. one <laughs> right so oh, good yeah. and then there's another one by robin schultz oh gosh what is it i'm gonna have to send it to you because i can't remember the actual name of it but that's another one where we listen to it and we get mm -hmm. fired up but it's like tied to a tournament um, I think this was in Vienna. They played this in Vienna and, oh, I just love this one. Oh, Speechless. Oh, I have to listen to that one. Oh, so right. good. So good. And you know what? <laughs> I also will always count on DMX to pump me up oh. for a tournament as well. So X going to give it to you? That's the one. Or MHP going to give it to you? There that you go. Change. That's what they should change it to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How about this? How has your salsa game developed since that May 2020 Beach Volleyball World Facebook Live? That is so funny you said that because literally three days ago, I put on Salsa for Beginners and nailed it. So um, I'm ready for level two. Come on. You need to put that on your YouTube channel. Oh, my God. Do you, do you think I should do that? I think I would lose followers if I did that. <laughs> level one mastery by Melissa Umana Pared. Yeah. Yes. Maybe I will. <laughs> Favorite kind of food? Pizza always. However, I love... Indian food. Um, I love curries. I love naan. I love dips. Tandoori chicken. <laughs> love tandoori chicken. Butter chicken, probably my favorite, but I love all Indian food. Oh, I have to agree with you on that one. All right, here's, here's, here's the unexpected one. Can okay. you read the statement I'm going to send you in the chat? 
when training in Hermosa, I enjoy breakfast burritos, but prefer empanadas. <laughs> I think you know why I asked that one. <laughs> I do. It was an interview with your partner, Sarah, on the net live, and she's talking about coexisting with you on the tour and how you have this very Caucasian accent when you say every other word except for empanadas. <laughs> empanadas. I know. I, I, it pains me to say it Englishified, like to say empanadas hurts my soul. So I have to say empanadas. <laughs> well, it's just hey, how I grew up. <laughs> I get it. I get it. You got that Latina in you. So you got you to right. be true to your Latina. Exactly. Your inner Latina. So, yeah. um, hey, um, Melissa, I, I so appreciate the time, but I wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to share a message to our listeners and viewers um, because without a doubt, all of us are challenged with finding a new rhythm and adapting to our current time in history with the breakout of this pandemic. Um, what words of encouragement do you have for our listeners and viewers? Oh, that's, that's a great opportunity to put me on the spot. Okay, let me think <laughs> about... <laughs> I really want to send something because, you know, this... this this time is really hard for all of us, like myself included. It took me a long time to um, come to terms with what my life now looks like and um, everything that, you know, could have been and should have been. So what I really had to kind of lean into was the idea of living day by day, which is really hard and kind of enjoying and being present in each moment. And I really had to kind of question if I'm here to just like live life and let it pass me by or if I'm here to really celebrate life and like soak yeah. in every moment and even now in the middle of a pandemic when things are so uncertain and things are not the way that maybe you envisioned or maybe that they should be um there's still beautiful things that you can celebrate and look forward to um and and it was a reminder for me to not less let this opportunity pass me by there's still beauty in each day oh excellent advice hey uh, Melissa I cannot thank you enough and i enjoy the conversation we've had it's the longest obviously being it's a, like <laughs> over an hour but i obviously don't get these opportunities when i see courtside when you're preparing for matches and tournaments so uh, thank you for taking the time for not only volleyballmag.com but for viral volley podcast oh thank you so much i had a blast i'm excited to hear the final product oh it'll be good stuff for sure <laughs>